Welcome to Hale Varsity Radio, the voice of Husker Nation. Insight, opinion, expertise, with the biggest and best names talking Nebraska across the state. Join the show on Twitter at Hale Varsity and at Schmitz underscore radio. Call in at 402-466-ESPN or 1-800-825-5865. Here's Chris Schmitz. Welcome to it. Great to be with you. Midweek edition. It's Hale Varsity City Radio presented by the Nebraska Lottery. Chris Schmidt, Elijah Herbal. We're loaded up. Plenty of NCAA news to get into when it comes to what the Pac-12's doing and uh, response to the COVID year and the portal by the NCAA. little relief for roster management. Mike Babcock with us in 20 minutes. Talk some big red ball with him. Uh, a Nebraska basketball edition, a standout uh, named Emmanuel from SMU to tell you about. We'll get into some Husker baseball with Babbers. Mike Shuart, Wilderness Ridge. Shuey will lay out the PGA for us as that gets rocking at Southern Hills tomorrow. So get, get Shuey's take on that here in 30 minutes. And then we missed Coach McBride on Monday. Had a chance to sit down with him this morning. And then we'll hear that conversation in one hour with Black Shirt McBride a Monday with Charlie. Numbers to get in. Join us today on Hale Varsity Radio, 466-3776-466-3776-800-825-5865. You can email the show, Chris, at HaleVarsity.com. And can find and follow us on Twitter at Schmidt underscore radio. Chris Schmidt, that's me, at Herbal Essence for Elijah Herbal. Elijah, you've been rocking the Salt Dogs. That was a stream-only game. But you've been uh, rolling the sleeves up, going at it. Did you get your lunch? You made you made a – you did a two-minute drill over to McDonald's for something that probably was delicious. And, well, you, you inhaled it. I don't – you don't you, – you left it. I don't know. 20 minutes ago, and, and now you're ready to, to talk. Yeah, so get this. I woke up this morning, roll out of bed, and the first thing my feet touches is water in my basement. Oh, no. You flooded? It wasn't you, didn't have enough, you didn't have enough rain to flood, or was it like a pipe that burst? It, so I've heard from people out in South Lincoln that it did not rain that bad in South Lincoln. It was coming down you for a rocked? good hour, hour and a half up here in, in North Lincoln. You're over hot, have lockish? Yes. Okay. So, uh, and, and that, that area is known to have flooded basements to begin with, just with how some of the, the, the drainage works out there. And mm-hmm. long story short, I, I spent my morning attempting to clear water out of my basement and then came in for a Salt Dogs game. Do you have a shop vac? I do. Okay. So so that made things a little easier. I started out with towels, and then I realized I did not have enough towels in the house to try to handle no, that. had an ocean in the basement. <laughs> so, uh, so it shot back it was, uh, passed off to my roommate as I came in and did Salt Dogs, worked Salt Dogs game, and then I was coming over here, and I realized, you know what? I'm pretty hungry. I haven't eaten yet today. Nothing. So, so I, I inhaled a, uh, a, not a double cheeseburger, a single cheeseburger and a McChicken for a grand total of like $2, and now I'm ready to rock this show. Good work. Way to, to be economical good story by mitch sherman he hinted at it yesterday when he was on with us and and mitch touched on the michigan state blueprint i want to start there before we get to ncaa news the the long and short of the ncaa news is the the next two years they are waving the cap on what you can bring in you can bring in more than 25 players okay because of the covid year because of the portal it's a roster mess. You can't exceed 85. So you've had this endless supply of players, or maybe you don't because they're transferring out of your program. But because of the pause year and the free year to, to, to leave and go everywhere, wherever you want, it's, it's a bit of a log jam. So the NCAA, uh, what they did is they... They, they shifted things here, waiving the initial counter scholarship limits in D1 for two years. And, and the reality is some schools, because of COVID and now you, you pile on the portal, they, they're not up to 85. OK, they're just not. And they're not going to be because the portal allows uh, mass exodus. So in theory, a program could have gone up to 32 scholarships in a year if it had lost seven players 
in the portal. You look at Nebraska's attack, and they went very heavy portal versus high school. Uh, but that that's okay. I mean, Nebraska needed to configure and bring in the talent they thought and then offset the talent they lost, or at least the bodies. And Nebraska right now, per Greg Smith, at 86. The expectation is you're going to lose at least three, right, if you go get those two defensive tackles here that you're hoping to get and maybe a wide receiver that's visiting this weekend from Texas. It's fluid, but it's doable. You can't exceed 85, but you can go, you can for sure go get more than 25. You are not capped any further the next two seasons at, uh, at 25. So that is, that makes some sense from the NCAA. Uh, the, the coaches, the athletic departments, football, frankly, needed some relief. You were able to benefit with some super seniors for sure. But then, all right, that, that super senior's taken a scholarship from somebody that was supposed to be incoming, that hamstrung you, that took away a new player to, to develop and, and, and have in the, the pipeline, so to speak. So the NCAA fixing things uh, for the better. Yeah, I just said that. They're fixing things for the better right now. Uh, Back to this blueprint, back to Michigan State. And what they did is remarkable. It's a wonderful goal to aim for. Is it realistic? Is it realistic to pull what Michigan State did last year? And there were some signs with Mel Tucker with you look at the COVID year, they went two and five, but both of their victories were were pretty shocking. They they took down an undefeated and pretty much butt kicked an undefeated Northwestern team. And and Mel Tucker, I know he's not beloved in Boulder because uh, you know he he got out of there and that's good for him. But he's he's a good coach. He's a good coach. He's a good recruiter. He's a good developer. But above all, he may be one of the most organized head coaches in college football because of where he has done his time. He's done his time in the NFL for 11 years. He's done his time under Kirby Smart. He's done his time under Nick Saban. And he's done his time under Barry Alvarez. Okay, So Coach Tucker was able to assess the situation. And, and really look at his team. He's inheriting kind of Michigan State on, on a down slope after the departure of D'Antonio. They peaked, and then they bottomed out. They weren't awful, mind you, but they weren't what they were five, six years ago, a playoff team. And what he looked at with this team is we had to really shake up chemistry. We had to really shake up what type of culture we had. And, and he did that through the portal. And and what he was able to hit on, he went out and, and 27 players transferred out, first of all. So he was able to gut what he had and bring in a plethora of guys. Now, Kenneth Walker was the jewel, second-round pick, sixth in the Heisman, all, all Big Ten running back, All-American. Wake didn't know what they had gathering dust. <laughs> But Tucker somehow did and had a connection to him, got him in. They got a left tackle from Arkansas State that was really good. They got a couple of linebackers that were good. Overall, of 15 of the transfers, five turned into starters, three of which were all conference. One was an All-American. Is that common? Is that doable? Maybe if you go get the right guys. Four young players are still in the program. Elite Carr projected to be an all-Big Ten tight end this year. And you flip the culture, you got the improved team chemistry, and you used the portal like NFL free agency because you'd spent 11 years in Jacksonville figuring out that game, how to go recruit at the NFL level and bring in talent to Jacksonville. Easier said than done. So let's turn our attention to Lincoln and we look at what Nebraska's done. We look at all the additions Nebraska's made on the defensive line, at the skill spots, at wide receiver, at special teams, and what is what's Nebraska's model look like? Is it close? Will it be close to the results, Elijah, to what Michigan State did? I don't think so. I think that's very 
aggressive. It'd be really cool for Nebraska fans if the Huskers finish 11-2 and and go to the Peach Bowl. <laughs> and I, and you can't slap that down and say, well, Ms. Sparty did it. You can. No, uh, I, I don't think so. The, the goal here is to be like Sparty and, and at least get to a bowl game, be in contention for the, uh, for the Big Ten West, if there's still a West to talk about. But what, what Michigan State did, I don't know that it'll be replicated, but good for them, really, not only getting a monster year two for Mel, but the big contract he got. And you want to talk about program with momentum in short order, not long after being a playoff team and then falling flat and then Antonio leaving you. And then you go, then you go steal Mel Tucker, uh, who was looking at LSU and, and Sparty landed. Uh, big time get, and he'll be around for years to come, presumably, unless Georgia or Alabama open up, because uh, then he'd, he'd no doubt get a phone call from, from both of those schools, potentially. But I, I think it's, it's, it's too much icing to, to see it happen a second year. A team can do this. I don't know that a team can do it this soon. And I might go against you a little bit here and, and say – it's it's not all that unrealistic, but it kind of depends on how you frame it. It's unrealistic if that's your expectation for Nebraska. This it season. can happen, but don't 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 expect. Yeah, it, it. it's it's one of those things where it's a realistic goal to have. Sure, you can have the goal of having a season like Sparty last year with the the talent and, and experience that's being brought in on the defensive line uh, with a power five starter and Casey Thompson at quarterback. I uh, really like what we saw from Anthony Grant in the spring game. Uh, a, a good running back mm-hmm. could it, it help that offensive line that that needs some more experience under their belt and the amount of talent that's been brought in in the back end in the secondary, you look at it and you go, sure, the talent should be there. What Mel Tucker did last year is is incredible, and I don't want to take that away from him because he did a great job coaching up that Michigan State team, mm-hmm. and it'd be We've wrong. We've seen be, him enough to know he's a really good coach. It'd be, it, and it'd be wrong to say, yeah, Michigan State did it last year. Look at the talent we have this year. Nebraska should do it this year. That's too far. But it, it's not an unrealistic goal as a Husker fan to have to, to say – you know what? If Michigan State could do it last season, Nebraska's got the potential to do it this season. If things go right, if all the the portal additions end up working out like they should, like uh, the, the coach, what excuse me, what the coaches uh, brought them in here for, if all that can happen, nine and three, ten and two isn't unreasonable. But it is unreasonable if you sit back and say, you know what, Nebraska should be doing that this season. Here's the other part of that. Think of of who Nebraska's brought in. I mean, on paper, right, Tommy Hill, high-level cornerback. Can he come in and and kick butt and take names? Trey Palmer, five-star dude at LSU. Can he come in and be, yeah, he's going to be the fastest, but can you get him the football and can he be dynamic as a return guy and as your lead receiver? You've got Bleak Road that got to campus, Bushidi. Can your special teams be good if for some reason you stall inside the 30? Or the 20, can you at least get three? <laughs> can you get three? If you go three and out inside your own 20, can you rock a punt, cover it, and, and make a team drive at least 70 yards on you to, to get a score? And then on the defensive side of the ball, you got Mathis and Drew, both guys from, from Big 12 programs. Kane Williams also uh, is a new addition. So Nebraska, from a star power standpoint, you went and got some monster recruits from some who's who programs. How quickly does it translate? Uh, and, and that's the thing. Great question in the Hale Varsity mailbag about, you know, the the offense. When, when does the offense kind of need to be sputter proof? And I think the consensus was, let's see what you got Oklahoma and beyond. Because... You're not facing the 85 Bears against Northwestern or North Dakota or Georgia South or Georgia State or whatever they are. But by Oklahoma, with Venables coming in, that could be a defensive ball game. We'll see. It's still going to be first team to 30, right? <laughs> can, can Nebraska inch closer towards that 30-point that number? Pac-12 News, they have officially punted the divisions. It starts this year. That in lieu of what the NCAA came down with again today, and they have put it in the commissioners and, of course, the conference's hands to do what they want, what they will, with uh, their conference championship games. So 
you've had some instances in the Pac-12 where uh, a nine and five UCLA or pick a so-so squad that's an eight and four product that is in the championship game over you know your second place team in the Pac-12 North, which is typically an Oregon or say a Washington or somebody, right? And and you've seen this movie a lot in the Big Ten East because it's either been Ohio State and then there's Michigan or a Michigan State that that are watching and you're you're two double digit or three double digit teams, one gets to go, then there's the West team that's good, that's respectable, that might be at ten and two or nine and three. You've had one Big Ten championship game that was high scoring and high flying and and that was Penn State Wisconsin the year Penn State got uber hot and they came back to beat Wisconsin and then you had a slugfest with Michigan State and Iowa but they just weren't Michigan State was playoff good Iowa got got rocked by Stanford it makes sense to put your two best teams in even if it's a, a rematch even if it's Ohio State Michigan part 2 within 2 weeks Position yourself to have two arguments, not just one for a playoff squad. We'll dive in with Mike Babcock. It's a Wednesday Hail Varsity presented by the Nebraska Lottery. Hello, listener. Hey, it's Chris Schmidt with Hail Varsity Radio, and I wanted to let you know about a special deal just for listeners of the Hail Varsity Radio Show podcast. We're offering $10 off the annual subscription price of $29.99. That means that you, for less than $20, can get everything we do. 10 issues of our monthly magazine, our annual football yearbook, and all the premium content we produce at HailVarsity.com. Just go to HailVarsity.com backslash subscribe and enter in the promo code GBR for $10 off a full year of Hail Varsity. That's HailVarsity.com backslash subscribe promo code GBR. And we're back. Fellas, oh, think we could listen to the radio? On Hail Varsity Radio, presented by the Nebraska Lottery. Yes! That's awesome! Thanks for spending time. Hail Varsity, presented by the Nebraska Lottery. Mike Babcock with his historian, author, Hall of Famer, at MD Babs on Twitter. Babbers, how you doing? Hey, I'm doing okay. No complaints. Good, man. The uh, yard's looking spectacular. You ordered some wonderful <laughs> weather. <laughs> yeah. I just have some mow mine so you can't tell that it's weeds. No, it's it looks... green weeds. Oh, it looks, it looks plush and beautiful. I drive by it <laughs> twice a day. I'm like, Babbers is just rocking the the uh, the yard. It's wonderful. Uh, Don't so, look up close. <laughs> <laughs> well, is that, uh, is that si- similar to Nebraska football here with the transfer questions? Uh <laughs> Right, I mean, it looks good from afar, but you get close. Yeah. Could it be? Could it be problematic? We were talking yeah. about you know Sparty and, and and what they did and the bar they set. Nebraska is going to kind of set their own bar, but Mike, as we dive in, there's still some additions potentially for Nebraska. But uh, your outlook, how do you you see things kind of meshing and gelling here with the, the expectations versus new faces, new bodies? Some are so important. It, you know that that's my question, Chris. Is when you when you go heavy into the transfer portal and you bring these multiple guys in from different places, and you know they're coming here with the expectation that they're going to play. I mean, you don't you don't go into the transfer portal and say, hey, "I'm going to transfer somewhere so I can sit and watch." Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, and so you have these guys. They come. My question is, how do you get them? to fit into a team concept when you don't have a whole lot of time to create that situation, if that makes any sense. I mean, if you're coming in, you're, in most cases, they're veteran players, right? Mm-hmm. Um, they're coming in with expectations. How do you create that team atmosphere? Um, and, and I think it's really difficult. Now, what I, what I think of... I always think of the past, you know, old stuff, comparisons. Um, remember when Bill Snyder got Kansas State going, um, he did it with a lot of junior college transfers. Mm-hmm. And and somehow he was able to get those transfers to fit into that team concept, and, and uh, Kansas State was successful with that. Not a lot of programs were able to do that. Um, and I think it's the same kind of a situation with the transfer portal. 
um, as, it, as it would be with junior college transfers, same way, um, because those guys are coming in with the expectation they're going to play. And so what about the guys in the program that have already kind of put in their time and, and moved up the depth chart, and then they get into a position where they're um, replaced by somebody that comes into the transfer portal? That's the thing that concerns me the most about it. You are right on it, and the the niche that, that Coach Snyder found – more times than not successful, they may have a, a, a down year and go six and six or not very, not very often do they miss a bowl game, but they were they were their peaks were pretty impressive com- considering where they came from. Mike, it really comes to buy in with your your new kids that you, you bring in that are expecting to play. And it also comes down to what, what you've got already laid down foundation-wise by the guys that are in that locker room. And the coaches say, look, you, you've got to compete to win your spot. you always got to compete, compete. Well, they're, they're following through on that, that warning <laughs> by, by trying to bring in the best talent they can where they think they need to supplement. So it's the guy's job that, that are, that's here to get better and either keep a job or win a job or be a good teammate if they get beat out. I mean, that's that's the dynamic that's going to be really interesting. Yeah, and, and that burden is on is placed on the guys that are already here. Mm-hmm. You know, they've got to be yeah. competitive because, again, the players that are coming in from the transfer portal, they're coming in with an expectation, and that expectation is, I'm going to play. That's why I picked Nebraska. Um, you know, you're not going to transfer somewhere where you, where you think you're going to sit. And so you you have that different kind of mentality than the guys that are already in the program who have to be very competitive and say, okay, you know, bring it on. I'm going to compete for a job. But there's a little bit of, of uh, the odds are a little bit against you, again, because of the situation. You know, what what do you tell a player in the portal to get him to come to your school? You know, you tell him that he's going to have a – opportunity to play right away i would assume Mm -hmm. and uh, that's going to be his expectation and if it doesn't happen um then it's going to be difficult mike babcock is with us here on hail varsity radio and mike let's get into the the transfers and what they could do for the team this season because you look at the 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 transfers that have been brought in during the scott frost era and uh for every Samari Toure, you've had a Kinawai Noah, which is uh, just saying that it's felt very hit or miss with, with the guys they've been going in and getting in the transfer portal. So do you think that, that this impact of NIL and what we've seen in the past 12 months of college football is, is giving Nebraska a, a better chance at upping that hit rate uh, as well as the, the results in the field last year? Or, or do you think we should expect that trend to continue of uh, guys in the transfer portal, there's a reason they're leaving other schools and they might not work out at Nebraska too? Uh, it, it, it's possible. I think that that's the case. And, and, and you're mentioning NIL complicates everything. On top of that, that's a different matter. Um, but on the other hand, it isn't. I mean, it's all part of the transfer portal. So, um, yeah, I think you're still going to be in that situation where some guys are going to work out and some guys aren't. And part of that is because the guys in your program are going to be competitors. They're going to compete hard, and they're not going to give up positions easily and maybe some of the transfers are not going to be in the position that they thought they were. So I think it's still going to, I think it's still going to be that way. But in certain areas, um, probably not. I mean, I look at quarterback, for example, and, and, you know, we've already made the assumption, although it hasn't been made official by the coaching staff, that Casey Thompson is going to be the quarterback. And that Chubba Purdy is going to be competing with Logan, Logan Smothers for the backup job. Okay, now, is there any doubt that that's what's going to happen? Um, my sense is there isn't. That there's no doubt about it. And Purdy is a younger player, so he's got some some time. But you've got some who had the mentality uh, a year ago before all this happened that, uh, you know, there was talk, well, when Adrian uh, finishes up, Logan Smothers is the next in line. He's the guy. Um, I think that, you know, his comment again, uh, in the spring, you know, I'm here, I'm staying. Um, showed what kind of competitor he is. But we look at the situation and you don't figure that going into the season he's probably going to be the starter. Mike, uh, got to switch gears and 
Let's talk Husker baseball. Nice win over Oral Roberts. Monster three games with Sparty where it's got to be broom time. Tell me a little bit about what the help Nebraska needs here. Lay it out how Nebraska can get to Omaha. Well, you know, I thought last night was a good example of what Nebraska can do because I thought Nebraska was very aggressive offensively and some guys came through and did some things that kind of we kind of expected uh, maybe all season long. And these guys have fought through, you know, injuries and 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 the pitching staff is, is – really got hammered mm-hmm. um, but I think they've got you know they've got some pitching they've got an opportunity against Michigan State I think that Nebraska is still in a position where you can expect the Huskers to sweep that series they have the potential to do that and I think it's a reflection of how competitive these guys are and how gritty uh, you know Will Bull term mm-hmm how gritty they've been, and uh, I think you saw a good reflection of that. You fall by three to nothing last night, and you come back and win the game nine to five. I mean, that's that's a reflection of how tough these guys are. Um, so I'm, I really think it's going to be an interesting uh, series this weekend, but I think Nebraska has the potential to sweep this series because of the way they played last night and the mentality – the push that that gave him. Initially, I thought, well, maybe that's not a good situation playing Oral Roberts. You know, maybe uh, you should consider not playing that game because you're having a quick turnaround uh, from the Illinois series and, and uh, um, you know, you got that Michigan State thing. But, you know, in retrospect, that was really a good decision to play that game and to do what Nebraska did. Mike, if you're Will Bolt, do you consider putting Dawson McCarville back in your rotation this weekend? I mean, he was a guy that was in the rotation to, to start the season and after some bad performances got dropped out of that, that weekend rotation. Do you think about after a good performance last night putting him back in for the most important series of the weekend? Well, I think we'll see in game three what's going to happen because I think it's going to be Shanneman and that's going to be Olsen and then we'll see where it goes from there. So he has an opportunity to be one of those guys um, in, the, in the third game of the series. But I, but I think they'll stay with what they've had uh, here recently, which is Shanneman and then Olson, and then we'll see. Mike, going to go to the NBA. How you feel about your Warriors <laughs> against the Mavs, bud? Boy, I don't know. I tell you, the Mavericks were really impressive uh, to go to Phoenix and win that last game the way they did. Um, I'm not overly optimistic, but um, competitive bunch of guys. You know, there's, I mean, this is really a physical, competitive. NBA playoffs, you know, all these games. I mean, guys are really uh, uh, giving it everything they've got. So um, I'm pulling for the for, for the Warriors, but it wouldn't surprise me if, if Dallas uh, gets the job done. They, they are playing really well right now, um, as is Miami, I think. Yeah, Miami looked great, and so did Jimmy, and Jimmy was on fire oh, last yeah, night. Oh, yeah, Jimmy Butler is <laughs> <laughs> He's a real deal. There's no question about that. Who's your favorite warrior? Are you a Clay? Are you a Steph? Or are you a Draymond? Or, you know, or, I like or other? But I, I, I like Clay Thompson. I like the way he plays. I mean, he just goes kind of goes about his business and and uh, gets the job done. I, I I really like that. I really like that. I liked his demeanor on the court. Babs, just tell us Dubs and Seven. We'll we'll we'll, uh, we'll erase the tape if you're wrong. Okay. Well, more I'm so yeah. That is. <laughs> <laughs> there he is, Mike Babcock. Babbers, what's coming up with, with you uh, with Hale Varsity? Uh, now we're starting to just start to work on the yearbook. Um, been editing, editing some stories. The next issue is is uh, went to the printer today, so it'll be out. A uh, nice story by Greg on Title Nine. A uh, nice story by uh, Aaron Sorensen on uh, uh, Megan Whitaker and her love of ice cream. She's uh, turned that into NIL. Mm. That's awesome. Can't wait for that. And uh, the yearbook, your college football Bible, Nebraska fans with Hale Varsity. Mike, have a good week, bud. Thanks for the time today. Hey, thanks for having me, guys. Be safe. You too. There he is, Mike Babcock. Babber's going to crank up a little uh, little NBA tonight. He'll throw on his Warriors jersey. And uh, I don't know if his windows are open or not, but he'll, he'll, admi- he'll have one eye on admiring that front yard. It's <laughs> just gorgeous. And the... Uh, the other eye watching 
little NBA. Good stuff. PGA. All right. Let's get down to Southern Hills. Let's talk with Mike Schuhart. He's out at Wilderness Ridge. That's next on Hale Varsity. Hello, listener. This is Brandon Vogel, managing editor of Hale Varsity. And I wanted to let you know about a special deal just for listeners of the Hale Varsity Radio Show podcast. We're offering $10 off the annual subscription price of $29.99. That means that you, for less than $20, get everything we produce. 10 issues of our monthly magazine, our annual football yearbook, and all of the premium content we produce at HaleVarsity.com. Just go to HaleVarsity.com slash subscribe and enter the promo code GBR for $10 off a full year of Hale Varsity. That's HaleVarsity.com slash subscribe, promo code GBR. And now, and now, back to Hale Varsity Radio. PGA Championship as the second major down at Southern Hills in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Mike Shuart with his Wilderness Ridge Golf. Shuey, it is some golf and weather, man. How are you? I'm doing great. Weather, sun's out, temp's up, wind's down. Sounds like golf time. Yeah, we uh, we played Saturday, and we played at a spot that the first two holes on each nine, wind was in our face. But you're going to be proud of me. A uh, couple of pars and, and a birdie, and I didn't Whoa. even cheat, man. This wasn't golden nice. tea. This wasn't putt putt. This was this the real was, thing. Yeah, this is a real thing, man. I love it. Uh huh. And uh, the 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 party I was with, two of my dad's golf buddies, uh, Calvin and and Denwa, both were like, "Who the hell's this guy?" <laughs> 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 so it was it was fun. It was good to get out. I'm excited to talk some some golf with you and get caught up on how Wilderness is doing, but. Let's talk about the consensus betting favorite, right? With the PGA is Scotty Scheffler. Your long shots, Tiger, but there's a lot of money in on Tiger at sixty to one. Caesars uh, likes is is getting uh, money down on John, Rom, and, and McElroy and, and and Justin Thomas. Who do you like? Who do you think threatens? Who's a dark horse? Let's go with those. I like Justin Thomas. Okay. Um. Dark Horse, mm, Corey Connors. Okay. Dark Horse. And uh, you always got your, your guys that are going to be there. You know, John Rahm, uh, I mean, he's knocked on the door so many times. Kepka. Um, Tiger's always fun because you just never know, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, um, he's so good. You just can't ever count him out. But. They got some super pairings out there. That's where I was going That's next. Sure. Is that is that unusual or or well? Tell me why. Why did the PGA go the way they went with the pairings? Because it's it's an all star match, man. It's incredible. Yeah, that just bumps up viewing. Yeah, you know numbers. You know you put those super pairings out there, man, and people want to tune in to watch. You know, so it's fun. I mean, you get the top players paired up with one another, you know, especially on a Thursday and a Friday, you know, and then that goes right into the weekend when now you got your pairings of who's going to win the championship. So just helps your viewing numbers, and it makes it exciting for the fans that are out there. You know, people get excited to go want to follow that group around, you know. You don't get to see those guys go head-to-head like that very often in the same group. So makes it fun for a fan and for a guy watching on TV. Mike, from a golfer's point of view, though, would you rather be paired up with some of the, the best of the best, or would you rather have a, a quote-unquote easier group where you think you're going to at least win the group and make it to the weekend? I mean, what would you rather have here? Because when you have these uh, these superstar pairings, you would think that competition breeds the best uh, the, the best results. However, with a, with a four-day-long tournament, I mean, that's a, a long time to be locked in going up against the best of the best. Well, the problem is when you play in those superstar pairings like that, it's all the periphery that goes on because it's just a chaotic mess because there's so many people trying to watch the same group. So it can be distracting that way, you know. So, But you always want to go out and play against the best. Mm-hmm. You know, a lot of it depends on who you are, though. Some guys are some guys are trailers. They like to come from behind and sneak up on you. And other guys are, are front runners. I mean, they like to get out in the lead. And they like to see if they can hang on to that lead. So some of it's personality, what you like where you like to come from, where you like to be. You know, like I said, the biggest distraction is that when you get those superstar pairings like that, 
there's so many people around, so much stuff going on that it gets annoying at times. You know, when you're not quite with that superstar pairing, it's not quite as chaotic. So it's a little calmer out there. So it, the, the player itself, he doesn't matter. It doesn't matter to him. You know, sometimes it's nice though because you get a guy that gets on a run that helps pull everybody else along with him. So that's the nice part about it. Mike Schwartz with us, Wilderness Ridge Golf. Uh, we're talking about the PGA Championship gets underway at Southern Hills tomorrow. All star pairings, good perspective there from Shuey. Shuey, what what is it going to take to win at Southern Hills? Lay out the course and the challenge tomorrow. It's a big golf course, you know, and it's a typical major. Rough's going to be deep, so keep it out of the rough as much as you can. You got to have a tremendous wedge game, you know, because you're going to have to get the ball up and down. Small greens, tough, super undulating greens, um, and a guy that actually a caddy will come in really handy this week because you have a lot of uh, uphill shots, downhill shots, uphill shots. So just being able to calculate, you know, the right yardage, you know, from it's one thing to hit it from a flat surface; a whole other thing when you got you know, a club and a half uphill shot that you have to add or subtract from your yardage, Mm. you know, so it's your caddy's going to be super helpful this week in getting the right numbers and the right clubs in your hand to get it on those small greens in the right position. $20 beers for an ultra. You have a take on this, I'm sure. What the heck, man? That's crazy. (laughs) (laughs) It's a tall boy, but but still, man, that's, that's been part of this too. Like, Folks are, are, are blown back. Augusta, from the, the looks of it's pretty affordable for with what they charge. But, man, uh, the... Uh, Those are like Super Bowl prices. Oh, they're, concert, they're worse than concert prices, you know? It's, yeah, that's, that's crazy. And it looks worse after coming from Augusta because you can buy a sandwich for like a buck and a half. That's true. You know? And now you're getting having to pay 20 bucks for a uh, drink. It's like, it's ooh, right, that's yeah. a little, little steep. Well, hey, it, it is a tall boy, though. They, they saw what went down in uh, in Phoenix a couple months ago, and they said, "What's the best way to to stop beer showers on our course?" What's the way to, to <laughs> twenty dollars <laughs> beers? <laughs> well, get the old credit card out. Shuey got a couple minutes here. What's happening at Wilderness, man? I know folks are teeing off and, and enjoying. And let's talk membership and uh, course uh, construction. Yeah, it's going crazy. I mean, there are people everywhere working like crazy, you know, and. And we have a tournament. We have what's called our Wilderness Wednesday. So it's kind of like a member guest tournament that are out finishing up. They're getting ready to come in off the course here in about, oh, 15 minutes. And then right after they come in, then we got our ladies league starting. So this is the first week of kind of our, our leagues and kind of our events. So there's a lot of stuff going on. A lot of golf being played and a lot of construction going on. And everything's getting closer and closer. So a lot of excitement. That is outstanding. Uh, Your pick. Give me your pick. I like Justin. Justin for sure. No waiver. No waiver. Okay. He's he's fourteen to one. I know you 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 said him earlier, but we're going to nail you down because you're pretty good at picking majors, man. Yeah, I like him. I like you know he's got a great short game, which you're going to need there. You know he's got enough length, and you know if his driver's on, he'll be pretty tough. So I like Justin a lot. Mike Shuart, Wilderness Ridge Golf. Uh, Wilderness Ridge, of course, uh, membership opportunities for you. Shuey, enjoy the majors. Enjoy Golf League tonight. And uh, thanks for taking time with us today. You bet. Thanks for having me. Everybody stay safe. There he is, Mike Shuart, Wilderness Ridge Golf. Getting cranked up there. Construction's uh, continuing. And uh, what a setup, man. And uh, I know he's smiling. You got the... Uh, David Dogs, he's proud of, so that's that's good stuff. Have you made a determination? Do you know who you're going with? No. No? No. You're like, <laughs> staying out of it. If I was a betting man, I would stay the hell away from this. Well, Shuey knows. I mean, he's... It's kind of like Shuey's approach shot. It's just a lawn dart. Hmm. Hmm. He's, he's right there. We'll dive into uh, Nebraska's latest edition for Coach Hoiberg next to Tail Bar City, presented by the Nebraska Lottery. And now, and now, back to Hale Varsity Radio. 
Back with you, Tail Varsity, presented by the Nebraska Lottery. Good stuff with uh, Nebraska basketball to give you an update here. The final edition, roster spot-wise, Emmanuel uh, Bandamel, uh, senior from SMU, joining the uh, Huskers. Ten points a contest for him uh, in the AAC, and it came down to, to Fred Hoiberg and uh, that connection there. And uh, 68 starts, Elijah. You've got Emmanuel from Quebec, Canada, and Nebraska able to get the yes uh, over South Carolina, K-State, Clemson, San Francisco, and DePaul. Uh, good guy that is 6'4", 180 pounds, can get to the rim. You look at his uh, three-point shooting, uh, 35%, good free-throw shooter, and hit 73s last year. And uh, it can get hot. Uh, streaky from three, but but a guy that can slice to the rim. And, and I think what's best to hear about Emmanuel is he's kind of a, a throwback, gritty player uh, from a personality standpoint. He's going to bring maybe some Big Ten edge to a Big Ten team that's needed some Big Ten edge. Can he guard? That's my question. I mean, because really, when you look at the, the Fred Hoiberg teams the past couple years, They've been able to score the basketball for the most part. They've had off games where the ball won't go through the hoop, but that happens to every basketball team. Their downfall has been, for the most part, their inability to defend in the Big Ten, both inside and outside, and uh, play 40 minutes of basketball with consistency. So if he can go do those two things, if he can guard well, if he can play 40 minutes with intensity, with consistency, everything else is just icing on top. If if he shoots 35% from three, if he knocks down 73s next year, great, but... A good fundamental experience basketball sounds like something Nebraska basketball could use next season. So I'm excited to see what he's going to do on the court. I'm not going to make any lofty comparisons or any lofty expectations, but I don't think it's a bad pickup. His reputation at SMU, high motor, relentless effort on defense. So he's uh, he's a guy that can score it, but is a two-way guy. He's going to D up and play for you. So it's down to two for Jordan Addison, the Bolitnikoff winner that was in the news and really caused some outrage from Pitt. It is either Texas or it is USC. No timeline yet, but summer workouts will get cranking up. And there's a lot of schools in Nebraska's spot, maybe not to the total number uh, of you know quarterback and wide receiver additions. But the reality is this. You want guys on campus to, to get after it. There's a little window here of, of downtime. You got done with finals last week. You head home for a little bit. Then you get back to campus and you start getting that seven-on-seven chemistry going. Then you throw the pads on eventually. And then, poof, it's media days. And then it's off to Ireland. Let's get qualified right now to beef up your backyard with – ESPN Lincoln, your chance right now. Caller 9-466-3776 or 1-800-825-5865. We want you to win that smoker, the Smoky Mountain Cooker Smoker from Capital Patio and the Flame Shop. Also a gift card, $100 gift card to Russ's Market. Some meat for that smoker. So we'll take Caller 9 right now to qualify. Your chance to qualify four times a day on ESPN Lincoln locally. You can also dial in if you're here at us outside the area with one of our affiliates, 800-825-5865. But we'll do another chance next hour. Coach McBride, we didn't catch him Monday. We'll hear from him next on a Wednesday with Charlie. Caller 9 now with ESPN. Pardon the interruption, but I'd like to save you some money. Hey, it's Chris Schmidt with Hale Varsity, and I wanted to offer listeners of this podcast $10 off the price of an annual subscription. That means that you, for less than $20, can get everything we produce, 10 issues of our monthly magazine, our annual football yearbook, and all the premium content we produce at HaleVarsity.com. Just go to HaleVarsity.com backslash subscribe and enter in the promo code GBR for $10 off a full year of Hale Varsity. That's Hale Varsity. Dot com backslash 
us subscribe. Promo code GBR. Varsity Radio, the voice of Husker Nation. Insight, opinion, expertise with the biggest and best names talking Nebraska across the state. Join the show on Twitter at Hale Varsity and at Schmitz underscore radio. Call in at 402-466-ESPN or 1-800-825-5865. Here's Chris Schmitz. Back into it, it's Hale Varsity Radio, presented by the Nebraska Lottery. We say hi to Charlie McBride, a Wednesday with Charlie. Coach is up in Michigan. Coach, we were just talking a little bit here off the uh, off the air about severe weather. Was Did Nebraska take some getting used to weather-wise during severe weather season for your family when you moved here? Well, the tornado part of it did. You know, the, the cold and the wind and everything didn't really – you know, do anything, even though, you know, we, we had been in warmer weather, you know, mm-hmm. before, but, um, you know, we had, we had just come from Wisconsin. So that, that was kind of a, you know, a pretty cold state. It was probably 130 miles North of Chicago. So, you know, we were getting the same kind of, same kind of weather there, but, um, but when we came to Lincoln, it was the tornadoes, the sirens, the, you know, and that type of thing that we had to get used to, I guess. <laughs> uh, it, it does take some getting used to. Would you uh, go see if you could uh, wrangle a tornado like you did rattlesnakes, or, or were you uh, yeah. were you cautious? Well, no, my wife, would. Uh, she'd sit in the middle of the house in the basement, and my son and I'd go outside and watch and see if we could see it come down. You know, or something, which wasn't really with her screaming in the background so but it, but it wasn't we never had any uh, in all the years I was there we never really had we had a lot of trees down front because of weather but um, not not tornadoes mm-hmm. Omaha had had one years before mm. Charlie McBride's with us Hale Varsity Radio coach uh, there's been a few stories that have ran about some wild interview processes for coaches where whether it's all right show me the scheme do some x's and o's or let's uh, let's just hang out uh, and go have a sandwich and a beer and get to know one another is there a coach that had a reputation that you uh, you know that was kind of a, I don't want to say weird, but a wild interview, or were they all pretty standard from, from some of your coaching peers in the business uh, back when you were coaching? Well, it was kind of interesting because I think a lot of the, a lot of the coaching and a lot of the stuff that, uh, that in those days was by reputation. In other words, a head coach uh, maybe that you had worked with before, uh, would would you know tell the the coach looking for a person who he thought was good or if he thought the person was good, mm-hmm. and it kind of went by word of mouth, uh, and and it got to a point where formality uh, was the only real part of it that that I I saw was just the trying to get to know each other, know a little bit about the family, what you know, kind of where you're coming from in in some in some ways. Um, I, I did go on the blackboard at Dallas, uh, for a few minutes. Um, but, uh, because, you know, a lot of these guys, what they do is they want to know what you do. Mm-hmm. They, and, you know, they, they, they want to know what number one, and then they, they make a decision that way too. And I think, uh, but a lot of it is still reputation and, and what you know, as you go through the coaching ranks, and go through his jobs. Uh, you get to know other coaches. You get to know guys you play against. And so that a lot of it is just word of mouth, I think, you know, more than anything. I think when you get a guy at the blackboard, sometimes he doesn't get the job, but you found out everything he does. <laughs> <laughs> Charlie McBride with this. So it's a pretty legendary story with uh, you and coach Osborne it was over breakfast did you have a, a, a napkin where you you'd, you'd trade numbers is that how it went 
Well, the best one I could tell the story is probably my wife, but uh, <laughs> how, I, 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 I actually never really, uh, and believe it or not, I, I guess I I never really asked him how he found out about me. I, I guess, uh, you know, it was, again, it was at a convention, so I know pretty much that Frank Cush and Buck Nystrom, who was our, one of our coaches at um, – at uh, Colorado when I was there, and I, of course I kept in touch with him for a long time. A lot of my background in the technical world comes from him and uh, on the offensive side of the ball. But um, I think they were both together from what I can kind of gather at, at breakfast one morning, and, and uh, Tom came and asked him, you know, if he knew of any defensive guys. And I had just moved to defense from offense. for one, I was only on offense defense for one year at Wisconsin. I moved from the offensive line to defensive line and, and defensive coordinator. And so uh, it was. It was kind of a, a deal where I didn't. I didn't apply. Uh, he called me on the phone, which was pretty interesting because you know those of you that have talked to Tom on the phone know that he's very quiet and reserved. And so he called my room, and I happened to be at the same number room. I was at three fifteen, and there's something, and he was at two fifteen. And he said, "Well, I'm right downstairs from you." And you come down for a few minutes. I have another interview, but so I went down there and um, got you know met him and talked for a while. And he invited <clears throat> Debbie and I to go out to dinner, but said he had to recruit first. And to go through the what you what you don't want to do is is go through the lobby with a head coach if you go to it from another <laughs> another school, <laughs> sure. because then the work goes through the lobby like you're crazy. This guy's going to you know mm-hmm. who knows where. But as you got older, it didn't happen as much. But so anyway, we, we the, the the best part of it was was I'm sitting there trying to think where the heck are we going to go eat? And I, it was Miami and. And Tom and I stood out in front of the place and looked down, and we said, I don't remember one of the two of us said, well, there's a Denny's. You know? <laughs> and so we went down there, and I don't know if we ate. I can't remember. We were drawing a few things on napkins and talking a lot and everything. And then he just um, got up and, you know, basically said that um, – if I wanted the job, you got the job, but he had to clear it with the Board of Regents mm-hmm. and so on and so forth. So they, they, you know, and then Tom's pretty accurate. I mean, he um, he said, I'll call you at 1030 on Saturday. And um, about 1030, he called. <laughs> and he had gone into the Board of Regents and, and had it cleared. And, and so then I, you know, took the job. But the interesting as the whole thing was when was a couple of years before when they played Oklahoma. I said to Debbie when she was out in the kitchen, I'd sure like to work for him someday. And I didn't know him, but I just heard of him. Mm-hmm. So it was kind of kind of you know interesting how it all turned out. Coach, do you still have the napkins, or do they get tossed? Do I what? Do you still have the napkins that you guys were drawing stuff up no, on? No, I, no, I, my, my, I, I, I thought maybe my wife might have stolen them, but she didn't. I, no, we. It, but uh, it was, it was, it was a you know a good conversation and and a lot about both both ends of the thing about families and football and friends and so forth. Coach, I want to ask you as as you were leading the defense. You saw a lot. You saw the the option and the wishbone. You saw the shotgun and the four wide. You saw the three wide out trips and one back. I mean, it, and, and now you, you've seen the spread and zone read game. What was most challenging to defend, and what did you enjoy trying to shut down? Well, I think the run game, of course, you know, it's always the same thing. Stop the run, and that's, of course, what we did the first time when I went there, um, Lance Van Zandt was the coordinator, and we pretty much stayed with a lot of stuff that Monty Giffen was doing. Mm-hmm. And some of the same terminology even followed me through the, you know, we didn't want to change maybe a call, what a coverage was called. Mm-hmm. Like when, when most times you'll see here on TV, you'll hear a, a two deep called cover two. Mm-hmm. And um, what what we did was they called it cover nine. 
And so we stayed stayed with that because that wasn't a familiar term. If you yelled it out, it was not a familiar term with the opponents. So it kind of stuck with us. You know, that's just one thing. But there were a lot of things that stuck with it. And, of course, that was the 3-4 defense. And, uh, you know, and, and as you know, on what, 81 or 2, we changed to 4-3. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Charlie McBride's with us, Hale Varsity Radio. You guys switched up. Was it difficult trying to stop the wishbone coach, or was it more about the, or more about the personnel? Well, the answer to your question is basically the hardest thing to, to cover is personnel. Uh, uh, every team has a certain person. Um, for example, when we, if they had two good receivers, if they had one, we might we might say in the coverage, um, twenty two double twenty two, mm-hmm. which is his number, yeah. which would be his, <laughs> you know, his number. And that off of a coverage, if they had if they had two people, then then of course he had to recognize numbers. And sometimes we very seldom did we ever switch. We, we really didn't move our personnel like they might today, or change the personnel. When we went to the four, uh, four three, we went to the type of personnel where we didn't have to change. So the thing was get speed. Mm-hmm. And the biggest thing with the, what with our coverage was is we had to have two corners that could cover. Period. And they they were going to be on an island by themselves a lot. So, so we we really worked hard at getting, getting speed on our linebackers, so we didn't have to move people around, and those backers could cover. You know, if they were in spread formation, so forth, could go out and cover them. Mm-hmm. And a lot of them uh, were defensive backs that uh, played in high school or became linebackers. Well, that team speed got after the quarterback and allowed you to cover man to man and be physical. And uh, what a mm-hmm. What a what a black shirt defense. Charlie McBride, a few minutes with us here, Hale Varsity Radio, a Wednesday with Charlie. Coach, going to switch gears. Things wrapped up with the Big Ten meetings. Uh, you'll have the chancellors and presidents uh, in, in June, uh, which, uh, you know, cheese and wine crowd, wonderful. But you had the athletic directors in Rosemont this week. What do you think happens with the Big Ten? Do you think they do away with divisions? and just kind of designate three or four permanent teams when it comes to solidifying and positioning for, for the future of the playoffs? You know, I, 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 there's so many different, you know, scenarios that I've heard. It's just almost crazy. Mm-hmm. So, but I, I think, I think the biggest thing that came out and I couldn't tell you what they are, but uh, was probably how they're going to handle, uh, you know, moving around. I, I don't, I don't think the big, well, maybe I'm wrong, but I don't think the big Ten's going to make any moves to bring any other people in. Um, I know that for a fact that probably Notre Dame has always been a, a, a team that the big 10 would accept right away. Mm-hmm. Cause I think they've already been asked to, to do that. But, however, they're tied up with the ACC quite a bit, especially in basketball and women's sports and mm-hmm. so on and so forth. So, you know, you don't know where that's going. And uh, But the other thing is, is I think a lot of the teams in the mid Midwest, uh, the Air Force Academies, Wyoming's, and some of those, I think a lot of those are going to end up getting together and, and doing some, maybe making a bigger conference and having some more people come into it. Mm-hmm. Um, but, uh, you know, and I don't know whether they're putting a limitation on numbers, mm-hmm. you know, um, some conferences have quite a few numbers, and of course, the Big Ten has fourteen, but yet is called still called the Big Ten. Sure. And uh, so, you know, there's so many different. But when you get the presidents together and keep the athletic directors separate, I, I don't know how much I, I really uh, believe in that. I, I I guess that they, I don't know whether it sounds like they don't trust each other or something. Right. But it seems to me. If you ask a person to run your athletic program, you'd kind of want them to be around, a, you know, uh, just like the the owners have the general managers around and things like that. So who it's, knows what? It's always do. an arm wrestling match between the the academic side and the athletic side, and 
uh, you, you need the input from both because a lot of the decision makers are the academic side, but the guys mm-hmm. that, and gals that know what's going on athletically are on the athletic side. So cor- corroborate and do what's best for the league. Uh, I'm interested. Well, that, Go ahead. God, that, that's what happened. And Ed, uh, basically, yeah, when I was, when I was coaching, uh, there was a period in there when the athletic director's power was actually taken away from them. And it was actually when there was all this stuff going down in the Southwest conference. Oh, wow. Um, and that had a lot to do with it. And they, they depended more and the vote came out of the faculty rep. So the idea was get to know the faculty rep really well and let mm. them know what you like. And, and you did that. I mean, but that doesn't mean they're going to vote the way they, that you want them to. Mm-hmm. Um, that had a lot to do with the president getting involved in it on the other end of it. So it, it was a little bit touchy. And I, I think that the thing that hurt the most was probably the, the ADs had, they were basically schedule makers almost mm. and fund you know, and, and so the other part of it was kind of taken away from him. A few minutes left here. Charlie McBride will catch up with Coach on the other side. And a couple of final thoughts. Uh, we'll get Greg McElroy's thoughts. ESPN analyst, uh, former Bama quarterback. He has pegged Nebraska as a team on the rise. You'll hear why in a little more info on a visitor this weekend. Uh, Texas wide receiver Marcus Washington. Headed to Lincoln. We'll tell you more about him. Hale Varsity continues after this. Pardon the interruption, but I'd like to save you some money. I'm Brandon Vogel, Managing Editor of Hale Varsity. And I wanted to offer listeners of this podcast $10 off the price of an annual subscription. That means that you, for less than $20, can get everything we produce. 10 issues of our monthly magazine, our annual football yearbook, and all of the premium content we produce at HaleVarsity.com. Just go to HaleVarsity.com slash subscribe and enter the promo code GBR for $10 off a full year of Hale Varsity. That's HaleVarsity.com slash subscribe, promo code GBR. Chime in, 402-466-ESPN, or email the show, Chris at HaleVarsity.com. Just try me, try me. Back to Hale Varsity Radio. A few more minutes here, Hale Varsity Radio, a Wednesday with Coach Charlie McBride. What, what did you see from Coach Devaney as, as his time at AD? He, I didn't ever know him, but was he pretty effective relationship-wise with the the presidents and the brass at Nebraska? No, I think uh, Woody Varner, I know, was our president, and they loved him. I mean, okay. they, I mean, you couldn't find a better person, and that's what we were we were. Woody was always, always going to be on the side of what Bob wanted, I think, you know, in, in general. But, um, you know, it, it it still goes back to the same things. They all, you know, they all have their thoughts. And when you get one group together, I know the, the, eight, um, the presidents made a lot of rules that didn't work. And, you know, it, it would be better if the ADs were making those <laughs> those rules and so on and so forth. But. So it kind of it kind of got in a mess for a while, but I think it's kind of back to back to normal. And I think that the important person is a faculty rep, and I think that person is important. I think it was probably a thing that kind of slowed things down in general, you know, with the, uh, maybe the competition between the presidents and the athletic mm-hmm. departments because of their different philosophies. Charlie McBride's with his coach. We'll say goodbye real quick. Is there a is there a game that you have uh, – we, we did a list with, with the, the website, most intriguing games for 2022 for Nebraska when you look at the schedule. It's an off-season topic, but uh, is there a game or a couple of games that you think are, are, are intriguing that you're, you're curious about? The, the three games that showed up, Northwestern, Minnesota – Illinois. I think that's that's a that's a great list, and they're not some of the biggest names, but coach, there are three names that Nebraska struggled with in the Big Ten. Well, I think the thing is, is in the Big Ten, I believe it or not, I think it's becoming uh, Ohio State's probably, even though Michigan beat them last year, mm-hmm. probably a little ahead, of, a little ahead of the you know the curve yeah. right now. 
but I think everybody else is, 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 you know, improved so much. I mean, compare, I coached at Wisconsin and it was all Ohio state, Michigan yeah. the whole time. I was like, well, Nebraska and, and Oklahoma maybe. Uh, so right now I think it's pretty, going to be pretty, uh, pretty, it's getting more, more, uh, on an even keel than I, than I'd seen before. And, and I think with all this changing now, there there could be some big changes. Coach, we will talk to you Monday. Enjoy your week. Enjoy time with friends and family. And uh, we'll send you some weather up that way. Some good weather. All right. Okay. I'll, please <laughs> do it. <laughs> okay. Thanks for having me. I'll talk to you next Monday. There he is, Mr. Blackshirt, Charlie McBride, and uh, the – Big Ten is getting better. You have Ryan Day and Ohio State at a certain stratosphere. Same with Michigan. They they broke through after a good start, a little bit of a lull, and finally a, a playoff appearance. And you, on one hand, you can look at the Big Ten and the West specifically and say, "All right, there's there's no championship caliber team." But Elijah, I mean, you're talking nine wins. For Wisconsin, nine wins for Minnesota, nine wins for Purdue, nine wins for Iowa. Iowa might have been a 10. I got to do my math over again. Now, you don't expect Nebraska to go one in eight in the league. And even if it's a down year for Northwestern, I mean, they were over, right? But you did have Illinois knock on that bowl game door. They were right there at five and seven. So, before we hear from, from Greg McElroy on, on whether or not he thinks Nebraska is a team on the rise, let's talk West in general. Does it get credit? Does it deserve credit? Because I think if you, if you were to pull the East powers, the big dogs of the East, there ain't easy, any, any easy week, be it in the East or having to travel somewhere West. Now, more times than not, a West team does not travel to the East and go win. They just they, they don't win those road games. But, brother, they're dangerous at home in their own venue at night during the season. Iowa's done it. Nebraska's done it. Northwestern's been pretty good. Uh, Iowa and Wisconsin are uber tough, and you don't want to – want to take them lightly and in the instances where michigan's gotten drilled or a situation where ohio state's gotten smoked a couple of times i think the ohio state losses were more we're taking these guys lightly i think you've had some hard fought defensive battles with when michigan's fallen and penn state's escaped once iowa city and then they got stung last year uh in iowa city so while you can bag on the Big Ten West as being the most gettable, and maybe it's not an insult, I'd say it's wide open, but when I hear gettable, to me it doesn't sound like there's, there's anybody that can stand up straight, and I think there's, there's strength in numbers with the West because it is difficult. Yeah, and I think this I think now marks the third consecutive summer running where we have come into a, a football season saying, wow, the Big Ten West is wide open this year. And as you and that's said... Not it, that's, that's not a slam. That's not a slam. It's not... We're not saying, oh yeah, any team worth a worth a crap could come into the Big Ten West and take the division. It's not like that at all. But Wisconsin's a great team. Iowa's a great team. Minnesota's a great team. Nebraska's got potential to be a very good team this year if if the pieces fall together how the coaching staff wants them to. Uh, it's not wide open for a lack of competition. It is wide open just because there's so it's much parity. It, it's, it's that it's tough parity. To, to, to sift through. It's the parity. The, the, the difference between the best team in the division and the worst team in the division in the Big Ten West is also probably the the smallest in all of college football. It's quarterback play and turnovers. Yep. Period. And and your special teams. Let's hear from Greg McElroy. Uh, was asked about Nebraska and Texas. Who's on the rise? Uh, why is Nebraska a team that can get it that can get it flipped around in twenty twenty two? The other team that we had talked about is Nebraska. Now let's check the boxes here because you're the one that al- that alluded to it. I happen to think they're on the rise. I'll explain why in just a minute. One of your qualifiers is they have to have been down. It's fair to say Nebraska's been down, no? Uh, I I think they they kicked that box in the teeth. 
<laughs> yeah, it's been max, a while. Max down. All right, cool. All right, sounds good. So max down. All right, two. They have NIL figured out. They do. They have deep pockets, and they have a collective that's doing quite well. They just landed Washon Mathis, who's one of the biggest transfer prospects in the country, uh, and should be well positioned to continue to attract transfers. They also got Casey Thompson. So that those two guys, in and of themselves, made it realize to me, all right, they have something kind of figured out from an NIL standpoint or from a transfer standpoint. So that would be box number two, three, uh, gettable division. You can make case it's the most gettable division in all of college football in the Power Five. Big Ten West, to me, while I have respect for Wisconsin, I don't fear Wisconsin. While I have respect for Minnesota, I don't fear Minnesota. While I have respect for Iowa, I don't fear Iowa. I think all three are solid. All three are beatable. So we got three boxes checked, two that are not. One, they don't have the recruiting footprint that others do. Totally gettable. Totally yep. understandable. Would never argue against that. There's no players in Nebraska. There's no players in Iowa. There's no players in Kansas. All the, all the states surrounding them, there's no players. So they have a very difficult task in front of them when it comes to recruiting quality talent. I, I totally acknowledge that. Two, I don't know if Scott Frost is the guy. That's the other one. Do they have the right coach? I don't know. I, I really don't know those things. But all I know is this. Last year they lost nine games by a grand total of – less than 100 points. Their biggest defeat was nine points at the hands on the road at Ohio State. I mean, they played teams tight. Those things have a tendency of correcting themselves from one year to the next. It's fair. I thought you were going to go Texas or Nebraska. No, and I was I actually yeah, he went Nebraska. Yeah, he went Nebraska. I was going to be more on board with Texas than I can be Nebraska. So, fair points by Greg McElroy. Now, he... This isn't to defend him. I think there's some ignorance. I can't speak to talent around the state of Alabama or the Sun Belt where he's from, but there's a, a boatload of Division One high-level players. Comparatively, there's not as many, but there are more. It's been a good run in the state of Nebraska for Division One talent in the Metro outside the metro so i think nebraska's getting getting better i think iowa's better i think kansas is better i think the midwest and 500 mile radius is much better with the the accumulation of of high level talent i mean you've seen teams come in from a clemson to an a&m to to go kind of raid go get go get iowa's best player go get Kansas's best player, Simmons, right? Kansas City kid, the the kid, the, the the hybrid backer that's now with Arizona, just as an example. So I think he's off to say there's no players. I think there's a lot of players. And the last two to three years, you've seen some some banner dudes. You you, you have a group of wide receivers for the 2023 class that can go play anywhere in the country. You've you've had kids in in the Xavier Betts class, Betts being one. Betts can go play anywhere in the country if he wanted to play football. So I think he's off there. But I I think he, he's not making the point that there's no players in Nebraska. He he's comparatively obviously, speaking it it's you you've got to get He's he's exaggerating slightly to make his point, but I I think his point is more it's a tough recruiting. If, if Alabama were to recruit players exclusively within a 500 mile radius of their campus, they'd be much better off. They than, can still go if, win a championship. And if Nebraska were to only recruit players within 500 miles of Lincoln, and not saying there's no players here, mm. but you're just as you said, you're probably not going to win a title with players only from Nebraska, Iowa, and say Kansas. Is, is he wrong or right though with not fearing Wisconsin and Iowa or Minnesota? I don't. Listen, Iowa, Wisconsin, Minnesota, for whatever reason, they aren't going to win a championship. They can contend for a Big Ten championship, but when push comes to shove, they're not going to beat an Ohio State or a Michigan. Well, think back to what Nebraska was in 2011. Did you fear Iowa, Wisconsin, or no, Minnesota? No, but they, they, were, they, were the dangerous, they, they were dangerous enough to ruin your season. Uh, dangerous enough that you had to give them respect, sure. but not dangerous enough that you had to fear them whenever you started this. I think he makes a great point there. No, and, and he's, he's on with that. They are dangerous enough, to, dangerous enough to ruin your season. They're dangerous enough, if you don't match their physicality, to kick your butt 
on national TV. But it's not like they're going to go win a national title in the next five years. Well, they just haven't had the, the horses. They, they When push comes to shove, they'll out-tough you, they'll out-fight you, but can they out-athlete you if everything's being the same physicality-wise? He's not wrong with the question mark of Scott Frost. Is Scott the guy? Well, he's got year five to, to get it flipped around. I'll say this. Scott has the coaching staff around him now to truly make a difference. That'll pay off in 2022 if it's going to be a successful year. A jock doc, an update on Teddy Prohaska next. Like what you hear, high quality radio and podcast is part of what we do at Hale Varsity. Hey, it's Chris Schmidt with Hale Varsity Radio, and I wanted to offer listeners of the Hale Varsity Radio Show podcast $10 off the price of an annual subscription. That means that you, for less than $20, can get everything we produce 10 issues of our monthly magazine, our annual football yearbook, and all the premium content we produce at HaleVarsity.com. Just go to HaleVarsity.com backslash subscribe and enter in the promo code GBR for $10 off a full year of Hail Varsity. That's HailVarsity.com backslash subscribe promo code GBR. He's in his 30s, but sounds like he was born with a stogie in one hand and a brew in the other. Now, say my name. It's Schmitty on Hail Varsity Radio. I got the body of a taut preteen Swedish boy. Back with you, Tail Varsity Radio, presented by the Nebraska Lottery. Time for a Jock Doc Wednesday. Nebraska Orthopedic Center, Dr. Brandon Seifert with us. Dr. Brandon, what are you doing? Hey, buddy. Just, uh, y'all just got outside here and enjoyed a little bit of weather. It's gorgeous out today. Do you have the golf clubs with you? <laughs> oh, I wish I would have brought the golf clubs. <laughs> no, I'm just on my way back to, back to uh, Lincoln from Central City. Well, yep. good no gloves and tote. Well, next time, next time. Uh, pretty big football season uh, on deck for Nebraska. And let's spend a couple of minutes. Uh, one of the key cogs, and man, he looked good early in his career before a knee injury. Teddy Prohaska opened up a little bit to the World Herald about where his recovery's at. And uh, Teddy against Michigan suffering uh, a knee injury, ACL, MCL meniscus dr brandon how common is it to see all three at once yeah you know fortunately chris and not not super common um you know especially to the point of needing to have all of those six um you know oftentimes we'll see you know whether it's an acl tear with maybe a, a slight sprain to the mcl um kind of a low grade one that doesn't need to be fixed and heals on its own and you just are working on the ACL from the surgery side. So, you know, pretty rare to have all those together. Um, obviously makes a recovery a different, you know, process. You know, as we always like to do, kind of rewind you back to kind of anatomy here. We've talked about the ACL before, anterior cruciate ligament. That's the big ligament in the middle of the knee towards the front. Kind of stops the knee from basically translating forward. Then you were talking about the MCL, medial collateral ligament. That'd be the one on the inside part of your knee basically kind of stops that knee from going to what we call kind of a valgus motion or knee kind of going to the inside, kind of like that knock knee deformity. Um, those would be kind of the two main ligamentous structures we're dealing with here. Meniscus is is pretty much the padding, right? Uh, and Correct. That is something that with all three, uh, Prohaska is about 80 to 85 percent recovery and a lot of pain uh, in the rehab, but the uh, good news is, is he's on the road to recovery. Eighty to eighty-five percent is is what he said. And give us your thoughts here on on just the rehab process, and take us through the fixes. Right when you go in and you you work on a on a player that had to to, to mess with all three of these. Yeah, and so. You know, again, the, the whole goal kind of early on in these is to get the knee moving, you know, before surgery, let some of that swelling work itself out, work on regaining some range of motion before surgery. Um, that's kind of in that two- to three-week time frame. We definitely want to get after these with uh, an MCL that needs to be fixed. You want to get after that a little sooner um, just because if you wait too long on those, the anatomy can kind of change on those. But in that first two or three weeks, that's that's still uh, an okay amount of time to wait. Once you kind of let those tissues rest, then you look at it, you know, from a surgical perspective. Um, oftentimes, this is more of a, you know, 
two bigger incision type of uh, procedure depending on what graft you use, uh, depending on the new implants you might have to use. For example, on the MCL, uh, your ACL is going to be pretty standard. Mm. Uh, but then your rehab afterwards is a little bit different in terms of you know what your weight-bearing status look like. If you're dealing with the meniscus repair, there's going to be some limited weight-bearing there for a few weeks. There'll be some limited range of motion issues related to that MCL repair. So there are definitely some more kind of technical pearls, a little slower uh, kind of recovery phase early on, but then usually these folks can catch up, you know, reasonably well by the time they get to maybe nine or 12 weeks out, depending if you're adding some kind of specialized therapy things in there that can kind of make up for some of that limited weight bearing. One of the things that we'll utilize, it's called blood flow restriction therapy, where essentially you're using a tourniquet to slow down blood flow to the area while doing uh, some quad exercises. It kind of stimulates some of that weight bearing quad fatigue that can occur that obviously if you're non-weight bearing, you're not doing. Um, it's being pretty simple with it, but that's a pretty nice technique that we use, too, in some of these limited weight-bearing settings. Dr. Brandon Seifert's with us at Jock Doc Wednesday, Nebraska Orthopedic Center. We're talking uh, ACL, MCL, meniscus injury and uh, recovery. You know, things to, to look at, not just confidence here, what's your mental state coming back, but just the different feel of your anatomy, Dr. Brandon. That's something that athletes got to get used to after such a repair. Yeah, absolutely. You know, stiffness tends to be more of an issue with these. So, you know, regaining that range of motion, in particular, getting your knee all the way straight, that extension piece, that's a little bit tougher in this setting. Um, he'll get it, especially with a good therapist, uh, but that can definitely be a bit of an issue. Um, so those would be some things that he'd battle that might be a little different than, say, you know, your standard ACL recovery. When it comes to, to ramping back up and getting after it, not only just from a conditioning standpoint, but a strength, it's – it's it's a it's a moderate process, isn't it? You can't just go zero to one hundred. You've got to take some time with this, correct? Yeah, absolutely. You know, you really do. You got to begin kind of slow on that front end. Um, as you kind of go through that transition phase, you might have to make uh, the recovery. Might have to make a little a little change here and there to some of the rehab protocols. You know, maybe you're not quite hitting the jogging phase as fast as somebody else. You know, maybe you're not hitting the kind of jumping phase. You do have to be pretty flexible on that rehab program um, once you kind of get past those six weeks. From a size standpoint, Teddy's, you know, six eight, six nine, three bills, and it's a lot of it's muscle. Do you see injuries common in football to guys that size, that height on the line of scrimmage? Yeah, you know, that's a great question, Chris. You know, as I look at that, I'm not aware of any, you know, high-level studies that have looked at that. It's an interesting point, you know, as I look across, you know, just my press in general and then kind of where I've been in fellowships and high-level high athletes, I wouldn't say that, you know, those larger sizes we're seeing more injuries in. Um, in fact, it almost seems like there's less of those you know, bigger fellas out there having those injuries. Now, that's obviously an anecdotal statement. Sure. I don't know what the national stats would be. That's a good question when you think about just the size of somebody like him and thinking about all the physics involved with what he does in a football field. You know, does that put him at an increased risk of that type of ligamentous injury? And I, I don't honestly know the answer to that, at least from a statistical perspective. Well, I was just wondering out loud because – uh, when you get guys at that size, that height, and played line at high school, you want to project to, all right, what's this position, size, and weight, and strength, and all of that? What what can you put on the frame, Dr. Brandon? Yeah, and so that, that's always a big thing. You know, you're just thinking about what are you putting on the frame. You start doing the math and the physics involved in that, and that's some pretty tremendous forces going through somebody's knees or joints when you're looking at just, you know, how tall somebody is and you throw 300 pounds on top of that, then you throw the athleticism. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, it, you would think that they would have, you know, more injuries going through that area. Um, but, you know, at that level, I just, I haven't seen that that is the case. I will say that at a younger level, um, you know, some of our kiddos that, you know, are, are still kind of in that development phase and haven't really started to develop, haven't really gone through puberty yet, haven't really kind of developed some of that kind of adult muscle mass. Um, as they're doing more high-level stuff, we're starting to see more injuries in that group. And I think that is because, you know, their bodies aren't just ready. They're not ready yet, haven't developed that adult muscularity to be ready to go for some of those higher-level moves and contact 
and athleticism that they're trying to push their body to. And so I think at that level, as you're kind of looking at that 12 to 16 year old level, there there probably is an increase at that level because of the you know volume we're seeing with what these athletes are doing now. Dr. Brandon Seifert, Nebraska Orthopedic Center and Jock Doc Wednesday. Dr. Brandon, thanks for the insight on this. We'll touch base again. Have a great rest of your week. Hey, Chris, you guys take care. Thanks again. Good stuff from Dr. Brandon, Nebraska Orthopedic Center. Uh, insight on Big Teddy. We will uh, do a stake and a beer bet. It's been a long time as uh, Game 1 of the Western Conference Finals gets kicked off here. Hail Varsity continues. Like what you hear? High-quality radio and podcasts are just part of what we do at Hail Varsity. I'm Brandon Vogel, Managing Editor. I wanted to offer listeners of the Hail Varsity Radio Show podcast $10 off the price of an annual subscription. That means that you, for less than $20, can get everything we do. 10 issues of our monthly magazine, our annual football yearbook, and all of the premium content we produce at HailVarsity.com. Just go to HailVarsity.com slash subscribe and enter the promo code GBR for $10 off a full year of Hail Varsity. That's HailVarsity.com slash subscribe, promo code GBR. Miss us? Come here, brother. Give me a hug. Bring it in for the real thing. We're on call for you. Catch the podcast at HailVarsity.com, the ESPN Lincoln app, or download them on iTunes. Saddle up, partner. Back to Hail Varsity Radio. One final time on a Wednesday, it's Hail Varsity, presented by the Nebraska Lottery, Chris Schmidt. Elijah Herbal, and uh, can email the show, Chris, at HaleVarsity.com. Uh, check that out. Uh, podcasts, Spotify, iTunes, Google Play. We invite you to check us out and uh, do so often. Give us a rating. Tell us what you think. Good, bad, ugly. We're all about it. Uh, we will have, uh, I think that's, do we not have basketball tonight on ESPN? Uh, would you like me to pull up the official ESPN Lincoln schedule sent to us by our uh, very own Jeff Motes? Yeah, we'll have game four next week. I don't know if we have game one or not. We do not. That's a sad proposition. That's okay. Anywho, minus five and a half. Golden State, yay or nay? Does Luca keep it rocking or not? Uh. Dallas, do they go on the road and steal game one? I I got to think Golden State... You got to defend home court, don't they? And uh, I saw and cover. I saw online that <clears throat> some of the uh, the Vegas watchdog people have reported that ninety percent of the bets in Vegas on this game tonight have gone towards the Warriors. Ninety percent, not ninety percent of bets, ninety percent of the money. So ninety percent of the money tonight is on the Warriors, which would make you think that Vegas would set the line so that the Mavericks would in fact cover. Because mm-hmm. so, they, they want to get that sweet, sweet 90%. You know? Yes, yeah. Well, and, and five and a half is no fun. <laughs> I mean, that number is so. It, it could be a five point game, could be a seven, could be six, could be four. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, mean I, I like the Warriors to win tonight, but to cover it. What's the, I don't have the money line in front of me. The money line, would you like me to pull it up for you? Do it. It is uh, the Warriors uh, are minus 220, 220 favorite. Okay. Whereas uh, the Mavericks plus one eighty. Okay, so you uh, go in Golden State because I mean you pick and we'll figure it out. I'll go Golden State to win, but the Mavericks to cover. So there's really no bet. What do you mean? Well, the Warriors I mean, win by less than five and a half. The that's, that's what I'll say. Okay, you want you want the Warriors? I'll take the Warriors and they'll win by they'll win by six. Okay, okay. Right. How, do you, how do you feel about the total? Two fifteen Staking. and a half. Give me under. You want under? Give me under. I'd rather just take in a beer on the on the total. I'll go over if you want to do that. I'll go <laughs> over 215 and a half. Let's see. Okay, over, under. <laughs> that, yeah, that, that line. Like, yeah, I'm just take in a beer. I'll take the under. Okay, I'll take the over because I look at five and a half on the Warriors and I go like, man, I don't even know what to do. I like New York Strip. Just so you know. <laughs> well, let's get you qualified right now. Caller nine. Makes it happen. Your chance to win the Smoky Mountain Cooker Smoker from Capital Patio and the Flame Shop. Also, the gift card to Russ's Market, that drawing end of May. But qualify right now. Give Elijah a ring, 466-3776 or 1-800-825-1450. 
5865. Caller 9 qualifies for the beefing up your backyard. How about a smoker? How about a gift card to Russ's Market? The smoker from Capital Patio and the Flame Shop. Caller 9 right now. Big thanks to Coach McBride, uh, Mike Babcock, Mike Shuhart. Full show tomorrow. Vogel, Jabba, Coach Barney, Danny Burke. A Huda Media Production.